Welcome to The Naked Entrepreneur. I'm Dr. Sean Wise, Professor of Entrepreneurship at Ryerson University, and with me today, one of my favorite dragons from Dragon's Den, Nicole Verkent. Serial entrepreneur Nicole Verkent has a knack for finding industry gaps and building innovative companies to fill them. Verkint founded the Canadian tech company OMX in 2012. Since then, this innovative platform has grown into one of the world's largest suppliers of ESG data. Verkint sold the company in 2022 to Sustainalytics, which is owned by Morningstar. Today, Verkint is the CEO of Buggy, Canada's rapid grocery and essentials delivery startup. As an active angel investor involved in dozens of Canadian early stage tech company, Nicole Verkint knows what it takes to be successful. Verkint was Startup Canada's woman entrepreneur, uh, Dragon on CBC's Dragon's Den spin-off, Next Gen Den, and an investor on Gimlet Media's The Pitch. In 2019, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce named Verkint one of Canada's top 40 under 40. Nicole, thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Sean. It's great to be here. It is great to be here, and it's great to have you here. I want to start in the early days. When was the first time you thought business might be for you? Oh, my gosh. Well, I grew up in an entrepreneurial family, so my dad was the wild entrepreneur, and my mom was the controller that used to like hide any spare money in shoe boxes that he wouldn't go out and buy another machine. Um, and we went through so many ups and downs. We were like the struggling sort of manufacturing small business that I um, saw through. I think I always assumed that I would be. There was a big period in my life where people would ask me what I wanted to do when I grew up and it was always pilot. Answer was always pilot. And I kind of laugh now when I think back to that because I'm on an airplane at least twice a week, so I'm kind of like a pilot, but doing the other thing. So I think I think there's just so many kids that see what they're, you know, all my friends whose parents were doctors, they've ended up being doctors. And I think you kind of grow up in that environment. And I always say I was so lucky because I had a breakfast table education where I would hear them fighting over payroll, over who to fire and who to hire. And, you know, we don't want to go in that market. And I could hear all that happening and it just sort of seep through like osmosis. So I was pretty lucky in that regard. But I didn't grow up in sort of, I grew up in this struggling entrepreneurial environment where it took until I was about 25 where the company really started to, to roll. No coincidence when you were starting to get more involved and getting out of school. But how do you feel those early breakfast table conversations that influenced you even today? You don't really know, right? It's it's all this stuff adds up, and I think I'm such a big believer. Everyone always sort of thinks you have this one mentor that changes everything for you, and maybe you do. But for me, from a pretty early age, I was always reading all these biographies and just talking to a lot of people, but reading a lot. I was kind of a weird. I'm actually more of a loner. People would never guess that, but reading a lot and talking to my parents and talking to their friends that they might have had, and I don't. It's kind of the same, I think, for entrepreneurs that come up with new business ideas. There was never really one moment for me. There was always just these all these little things that kind of added up. And when you look back, you go, oh, yeah. Is there one biography that you remember or an autobiography that you remember that really had an impact? Was there someone that you looked up to? Oh, there's so many. Um, Izzy Asper's biography I love. That's a great story. Um, I just finished uh, working with Howard Green on Hunter Harrison's biography. American Entrepreneur Turnaround, two old school Canadian companies. Such a good book. Um, I got to read it before it came out. Um, there's lots of good stories out there. Steve Jobs, obviously, everyone's read that book, but it's a great story because you're in, he's inventing something from nothing, which is a great, uh, and I like that story because like your show, it talks about the reality. It's not dressed in just like, wah well, it happened, I had an idea, or aha, the product came out. It talks about all the stuff that happens leading up to it, which is not that glamorous. Well, let's talk about that. Can you share with us some of your not glamorous stories on your oh rise to fame? I mean, people only see the good, right? Yeah. And then it gets exacerbated by television shows. Yes. But the truth is, is it's incredibly hard. Can you share some of the hardships on your journey? Oh my God, I think you blocked them out too. Um, well, you remember the good stuff more than you, 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 you <laughs> think about the bad stuff. There was a lot. Um, when I came into our family business in 2010, we were rolling, we were doing really well. And I had another startup before that in manufacturing and we had integrated it in. And I was working in the family business and we had huge customer concentration. So we were selling 
huge portion of our revenue right? um, to the U.S. government. The US government. We were selling these really high-tech coatings that confused radar and infrared to the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And when I came into the business and started working in the business more full-time, we got a phone call one day um, from the U.S. government saying, you know, we kind of screwed up our orders and we totally over-ordered last year. You know that time that we encouraged you to buy another factory and make all this additional investment? And so we're going to be going down significantly in the next few years. And so at a very young age, I think I was 26 years old at the time, I had to learn about you know what you do when that happens and so downsizing yeah, stepping back yeah i think i think we laid off 250 people on like one of my first days coming in trying to lead this organization and uh so big layoffs and 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 so obviously at the time it was horrible and my friends used to laugh because i remember all i ate were this <laughs> one of these suppliers would come in and bring this huge box of donuts in the morning that's all i ate i ate tim hortons donuts for like four months Wow. Believe it or not, just, I lost weight. Just to be weight. comfort, just to be comfort yourself from all the fires. I think I was in such a rush that I never spent time thinking about um, actually ordering the right food. So that's all I ate for months on end. Um, but how at 26 do you deal I with firing all those no people idea. other than donuts? I had no like, idea what I was doing. Um, it's all about hiring the right people. It was amazing timing because it happened in 2010. And I, what I ended up doing was I found one of the lead guys who helped renegotiate all the GM debt okay. and deal with that disaster in 2008. And he was out of work. 2010, things were better. You finished the GM So work. we brought him on board, and uh, he was awesome. He was funny. And, and to make it light, because it's not a light time. I mean, this is a family business. has been around for 37 years. We had to make some real changes before we sold the company. And we had nicknames for everybody, and we, we kind of tried to make it fun and we um, because we were working very hard and taking no time off and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, when you're in it, you're going, life is horrible. And then always makes sense backwards. You look back and you go, now I have this element to myself where when you're tempted to start overspending and when you start to start to get, you yeah, know, that second guess come it's on. not until you have to reduce your costs exponentially that you start to realize, oh my God, we were paying Xerox for six photocopiers that never got used. And every, you know, there's all these things that you find with the fine tooth comb that just end up, especially in B2B and big, you know, manufacturing companies. So um, I think it taught me at a pretty early age about it's that magic formula. It's revenue minus expenses. And if you can change expe expenses, you have a lot of control over. So the formula for people who are wondering is profit <laughs> equals revenue minus expenses. It's not that complicated, but that's what it comes down to. You have to, it's to not, be sustainable, you have to make more yeah. than you spend. And it's just so tempting when times are good, you get bullish on that kind of stuff. Um, whereas you need to be in a nimble enough position that you can withstand that kind of thing and that you and you can also take on other clients from other sectors, et cetera. Now that sounds really mature for a 26 year old. So let's go back a little bit. You're in your teenage years, or even younger, and you wanna be a pilot. How does that evolve and you end up at university studying what you studied? Like how, did, how do you get from one to another? I don't remember. Um, I studied political science in my undergrad okay. and then I went to business school, um, the Ivy School of Business at Western and I remember when I went through that program, I think it was 2005, it was so uncool to do anything except management consulting or investment banking. Well, I don't know if I banking like is, that. No, MBA, oh, was, I went to Ottawa U for my MBA, but that was, what, you didn't succeed unless you were at right? some iBank or. And these guys were going to all these fancy events and they were being sold on which company they would go to and they get these, these bonuses for joining. And I just remember feeling incredibly, I went to like two interviews and I wore this horrible suit with these big shoulders. <laughs> I don't remember, I just remember feeling like I was in, I was not feeling like this was me. And I, w I tried to go to one of the events and I remember I had like this pocket of sweaty business cards that had University of Western student on them. You know, you had to give them to the recruiters. To the <laughs> so it felt so awkward. And I just remember feeling incredibly awkward and um, I met somebody at a party, I, I can't remember, and I remember asking him what he did. And he was this crazy guy, a Dutch guy, and I have a Dutch background. And he said, I sell economic reports for governments. Wow. So he, he had no base salary, he worked only on commission, and he ran around, and I see them now all the time, because I did this for six months. If you open up The Economist, there'll be this cheesy 
report yeah. in the middle of it, which is an advertorial for a country. Yep. So come to Gambia. We have amazing agricultural whatever, right? Okay. They're selling something in their country. And so it's an it's an advertising play, and but it's got this political element to it, and um, it has a business element to it. Obviously, I had so I had a poli sci for two years, and then I went to the business program. So I met this guy, and he goes, "Come interview. You can meet these guys in Toronto." So I met them, and he's a bit of a cheesy company. It was very very sales focused, but I joined the company, and I got to travel around the whole world. We had our base in Belgium, and they put me on a bunch of Caribbean countries, and. I went and sold these advertorial reports. I actually did quite well. Commission but how only. do you go from someone who doesn't want to talk about themselves, someone who feels uncomfortable networking, someone who, yeah. who's still at the early part, to the confident go-getter that we see before us? Like, that doesn't happen overnight. No, so no. how does it happen? Yeah, no, that's 12 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do a lot of public speaking now, and, you know, we're on stage this morning, and I was kind of reflecting that, you know, five, six, seven, maybe a little more, eight years ago, I would have been so nervous or just so and it just I think the number one word for anyone out there is practice it's just practice so just keep your head down keep it's doing it practice. and eventually you wake up less nervous yeah it's just that's that's my experience it's just practice you just keep doing it and then it becomes normal it's your normal life okay. so you go on to to, to to join the family business what are the pros of being part of a family business and what are the cons? Because it may not be the sexy Silicon Valley startup, but there's more family-based companies in Canada yeah. than there are sexy Silicon Valley startups. So yeah. what was that like for you? And was there advantages to, to joining a family business or was that a disadvantage? You're 26, your father's been a huge element in the business, now you're coming along, the first thing you've got to do is fire people. So talk to me through yeah. the family business aspect. Yeah. Um it's incredible. It's an incredible experience that I recommend to anybody. And, and I've seen the stats that a lot of these family businesses are not transitioning to the next generation. Succession planning has become very difficult. Which makes me kind of sad because there's something there. Your parents have started something and there's something, there's a real business there. And you have the opportunity to add sort of the younger, newer technology and newer thinking towards that business. So the pros are, I've always believed as an entrepreneur, you don't really have, you probably can relate to this. You don't really have your work life and your personal life. You just have a life, right? It's just mm -hmm. you're working on Sundays. You're not working Monday afternoon. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just there's a life, and that's every you're doing everything. So I think one of the pros is it really merges that. I mean, because family is also work is also <laughs> workplace. It's also Thanksgiving Sunday. You're arguing over something, but there's a lot of loyalty there. There's never this. I think that my family, maybe some families are kind of screwed up, but you never think that someone's trying to overturn you or that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. There's real loyalty, you kind of know you're not going anywhere. Um, I mean, some of the cons is I remember having like <laughs> family arguments in the hallway at the office that everyone could hear. Yeah, so, and vice versa, you've had business arguments at the family home. Yeah, so it can get, uh, but I highly recommend it to anyone. I think there's so much you can learn. And for me, I was really lucky. I. I was supported in my first startup, so I did that ad thing, and then I did a startup in offshore manufacturing, and then joined the family business, and then started this tech company. But um, I was, I got insight into, if you go and work for your family, who are the CEOs of the company, you get insight into that level of decision making at a bigger level than you would if you were just starting. So I got insight into how you negotiate fair and equitable severance packages, and how you, grow a business and go and get capital to buy more equipment. You get insight into that, which you wouldn't normally if you were 26 and you were joining as an account manager or somebody lower down in a company. You don't get that oversight strategic view of how it all works. So that's the pro. What's the con? Oh, the con's the fighting in the hallway. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, you mentioned work-life. The con, sorry, the con <laughs> is you take it very personal and, and you refuse to let go. And that, I think, is also the pro. So you get entrenched because you well, have all of this history together. It's personal. Your father saw you when you were nothing, and now you're something, but you got to find that balance. Well, somebody says to you, you know, across the table, if they're, you know, want to play around with a sale or something, they go, it's not personal. Well, it is to me. It's your family business. Yeah. <laughs> you talk a little bit uh, earlier about work-life balance, and we have a colleague, Bruce Croxon, that, that always said something that resonated with me, which is an entrepreneur's work-life balance is you work your ass off for 10 years so that you have enough money to take the next 10 years off. You can't <laughs> turn it on and off. You are the entrepreneur 24-7. And yes, you may have to work Sundays, but then you take Monday mornings off to, to play hockey with your kids. How do you find work-life balance? 
you Let's agree with that philosophy? How do you manage it? Well, your... I'm not in the Bruce's 10 years off stage yet, so I want to be in it. Um, I wouldn't have agreed with you a little while back in, until, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm going on my 11th or 12th year doing entrepreneurship, and it's a marathon. Like, mm -hmm. if you ever train for a marathon, which I've done before, it's like you don't sprint at any point in time. And so you start to get appreciation for that and realize if I'm going to be out at a dinner every night until this time and then waking up this hour and, and getting back into it, you're going to you're gonna crash and you're going to start to not like it. And um, you need a lot of energy, especially, you know, for me, I'm selling technology now and I'm trying to go into big companies and try to show them something, try to get them to use their imagination and picture something that doesn't exist today. How do you do that when you're drained and exhausted? So. I think it's important that, that entrepreneurs do find it. How do I find it? Um, I, it I, you try to take weekends off, right? It's, it's, you, you have to take that time. So uh, I've definitely found it a lot more in the last few years, for sure. Do you feel there's a different pressure uh, based on gender for work-life balance? Do you feel that there's a, an additional pressure because there's an expectation in some way, or you have, might have an internal expectation. Is, is, is it different? I believe 100% it's different if you have kids. So I, I don't have kids. I don't think it's different for me at all. I don't think there's an expectation that I um, have. So it's not the gender, it's the kids. That's what I think, specifically. But the kids as a woman, I think okay. it's because there's lots of men that have newborns. You don't even notice a difference. But if a woman has a new, I mean, you're noticing her not at work and yep. all that kind of stuff. So. I believe that's where it starts to get really, really tricky, and there's a lot of women my age that are really grappling with that issue, and they're also trying to lead companies, and so I don't, I'm don't, i not sure you can have it all in that sense. How will you have it all? <laughs> I don't know. Have you this thought really about that? This really is a naked show, isn't it? Oh, well, it's not the semi-dressed um, entrepreneur. It's the naked entrepreneur. We're trying to share the, the, the blunt truths. Is, is kids something you think about? Is a family something you think about? Or is the business your baby? Um, I think I think you have to make sure that you're enjoying your life the whole time as opposed to thinking about it the way Bruce thinks about it. I mean, it would be nice for people to say, yeah. I'm going to work like a maniac and then I'm going to have 10 years where I'm basically retired and just playing around and then I can have kids and all that kind of stuff. I think that's a way to do it, but I don't, to build a business properly, you need at least 10 years, at least. And so, you know that, I mean, unless you get some kind of unicorn out of the blue. But to build it properly and to lead a company properly, you need at least that much time. And so, you can't think about when this is done, then I'll do that. I think you need to learn how to introduce um, work-life balance and family into your life. You so know, how are you going to introduce it in the next three to five years? Is that something you're thinking about? Oh, no, I mean, I've introduced it in my life in the sense that I'm you know, taking more time off and that sort of thing. But yeah, it's, I believe that if you're running full speed as the CEO of a company and a woman, I think it's very difficult, unless you're Marissa Meyer and Yahoo, to actually take a year and a half off. I think you have to find a way to... Well, she also brought the baby to the office yeah. every day and had nannies on call. It's a little different when you're a real person and you have to deal with mm. these things. So does that mean you are or are not going to have a family in your mind? Oh, I don't know yet. I still have some time. I should call you I'm dad. I'm only 34. Right. <laughs> you are. You have lots of time and all the time in the world. But but I, I find it hard to believe you haven't thought about it. Yeah. And, you know, myself and some friends were having some egg freezing parties. So it's okay. You just buy yourself a bit more time. <laughs> I totally understand. I totally understand. You mentioned a little earlier about mentorship. And that's a really hot topic. You know, what is the difference between mentorship and coaching yeah. and what is, how do you find the right mentor? Can you think back to a mentor that had a huge impact on you and maybe share that story with us? Yeah, very early on um, in my life, I think it was in second year, third year university, um, I met a woman named Angela Mondu. We're very good friends today. And she was one of the first employees at RIM. And so she got the Blackberry on the Oprah show and tried to introduce it into the market. And she had just written a book about innovation where she interviewed a bunch of different uh, leaders. I think Steve Jobs was in there, that sort of thing. So she had just written this book. And um, when I was in university, I sort of interned to help her um, with the book launch and bring it to our university and that sort of thing. So we met in that way and we've stayed in close touch over the last 10 plus years. And uh, 
I think it's she was very unique in that she was in the Air Force and was in a war zone in Bosnia and then was in the tech sector, Nortel, and then RIM. And so that was a pretty unique profile Absolutely. for me as a young 20-something-year-old to see a woman that was uh, 10, 20 years older than me that had been through all that. And so I think it's important for um, especially younger women to be able to see some of those examples. So she's she's been a mentor. And then kind of like I said, there's just so many people that contribute that – I think it's hard to say you need to have one formal mentor relationship next. I think, I think you get stuff from everybody. The second mentor I had was actually kind of a funny story. I took a little bit of funding from CYBF, the Canadian Youth Business, Business Foundation. Foundation. Now like, called Futurepreneur. They've rebranded. Okay. So it was like $10,000. It was nothing, yeah. but at the time at the I time. wanted it. And, um, they and it comes said, with a mentorship. Futurepreneur used to be CYBF. It's a requirement. It's a required. It's a You're requirement. forced to have a mentor. So I was an arrogant little, like, I think I was 27 at the time. I don't need a goddamn mentor. And so I took this money and I signed this thing saying, I promise I'll meet with this mentor once a month for, I think it was two or three years. Two or three remember. years, yeah. Are you a mentor with Futurepreneur? You should be. I am. I, I'm very blessed to be involved with Futurepreneur, and it is a great program. All right, so I was pissed off. I understand. I was really mad about this requirement. I said, I already know everything. What the hell? I have work to do. I, don't, I can't sit around. Only a 20-year-old knows that they know everything <laughs> in the world, right? Pontificating about the future of the universe. So I sit down across from this mentor I've been matched with, and... He, Can you give us some context? A guy, a gal, older, a younger, guy. industry, he's a guy, non industry. Yeah. He's okay. he's done a whole bunch of interesting projects. Uh, anyways, he was amazing. I said to him, <coughs> I showed up, I sat across from him, I said, I don't want any pontificating. <laughs> no pontification zone. <laughs> Do not I go, it. if we're gonna do this, we should be actually working in these sessions. I don't wanna sit here and just hypothesize. Uh, so he goes, oh, okay. <laughs> and um, at the end of every session, we actually wrote down action items. Mm -hmm. And he was the only person in my universe at that time that I reported to. And so it gave you a sense of accountability. It was awesome. It was really Not just good. Advice, I got really into it. I said, we should make that one an action item. Oh, okay, if you want. And then I had to email him the action items. And then I had to follow up right before the next session where the last action items were Absolutely. at. Absolutely, that's it how we do it. It was awesome. It was so good. So um, what do you tell the 20-something-year-old superstar who's getting into Futurepreneur and says the same thing, I don't need a mentor? How do you convince them now? you got to force them. <laughs> so just do it and the value will come to I fruition. don't know. I mean, for me, it was because I was forced into it. But, I mean, I ended up having such a good relationship with this guy that I, I actually hired him to come in and coach our sales team afterwards and that sort of thing. And that speaks so, volumes. He, he is awesome. He's really cool. Now, how do you feel that it's flipped? I, I haven't asked you this personally, but I'm going to assume you get lots of requests from uh, young entrepreneurs who want mentorship or think they want mentorship or want your money or, or want your help. How do you screen through which of those will get a portion of your time when your time is already at 100%? So, yeah. so now that you are the mentor, not the mentee, how do you approach it differently? Well, I believe I'm both. I'm still a mentee um, to a lot of respects. I actually just joined the Business Council of Canada, if you know that organization. Mm -hmm. It's the CEO of the 100 biggest companies in the country. And they actually, good on them, they did this initiative a few years ago where they've invited eight of us. Like a are, next gen, right? It yeah. was, yeah, I heard that. So um, I'm completely in the mentee position in that, which is amazing. But so how do you mentor? I mean, that part's hard. I think you have to try to, for me, I'm trying to mentor people where I can, I feel that I can actually help. And so there's only so many areas where I, I feel like I have certain industry experience or certain relationships or contacts or, I mean, I'm in a pretty unique space where I'm working in this very industrial space and government comp. So it's like, how how can I specifically help versus just any entrepreneur that knows how to kind of raise capital and build a team? So that, that's one filter that I'm Are you finding for. it as rewarding? Oh yeah, it's a lot of fun too. Um, I mean, that could be a full-time job, just mentoring mentoring and for investing sure. in startups. It's, uh, it's really, really fun. And I'm very conscious that it can't take up that much time. You have to keep it isolated. Yeah, I'm in an operating CEO role. I'm not on the, other side of Bruce Coxon's formula. <laughs> well, hopefully one day soon. You know, we talked a little earlier about the impact of gender and how how it can shape decision making. Recently, 
a survey came out that talked about the sexual harassment in the investment world, uh, about how unfair it is, about the, the discrepancy between female founders and male founders. And I was horrified because as, a, as a good... I wasn't surprised, right? But I was horrified because these are the future... Uh, thinkers, the future viewers, they're, they're the gating item, and to prolong such outdated things was horrifying. But then I just realized I was just oblivious, yeah. I, I, because, because I assumed I don't do these things, so others won't, but they do. I hate to ask it and put you on the spot, but have you had those Me Too experiences? Have you been put in a spot where you aren't comfortable, and, and if so, how do you reconcile that? How do you how do you deal with that? Because if it's not you, I'm sure there's lots of people watching who that may unfortunately happen. Hopefully less I've now than I've never more. met a woman entrepreneur who hasn't. And and of course I have been in those experiences for sure. And it's horrible because I mean you put yourself in this in my shoes. You've just raised some money from friends and family. So now you're lying awake at night going, oh, crap. How am I going to get Uncle Tom's money back? Yeah, How am I going to get scary. Aunt Sue's money back? And yeah. then you go into the market and you want to raise money. And Buddy texts you back and says, well, I'll meet you at 7 p.m. At, at this bar for your pitch. And you're going, oh, OK. And then you meet the person. And, and then now they've cornered you or something ridiculous. Because they're in a position of power. They have the ability to approve whether or not you get funding. So you know, why not? maybe take advantage and, and whatever. So that happens. And then um, for me, I wasn't able to raise capital. So we just moved ahead. We got some capital from a customer and we, you know, we moved forward from there. Then I start selling. And now the chief procurement officer who's going to decide whether or not I get a contract says he needs to meet at a bar and it's the only place they can meet. And, um, and so you face it there. And it doesn't matter where you turn. And for me, in the early days, it was like everywhere I went. I'm so attractive. Everywhere I went, there was there's this, some, some being kind of creepy inappropriateness, and this was you know almost ten years ago. But um, it's crazy because you you're not in a position. You don't have an HR department you can go complain to, right? You're not working at a big company going, my boss over here is harassing me. Can you please uh, save me? You're an entrepreneur, and you're just trying to raise money. You're just trying to make cash flow and make payroll, and you're just trying to make sales happen. And so. Who do you complain to? I mean, with, with the exception of my mother, who I used to call and sometimes cry, and she'd tell me, just put on your big girl pants and go out tomorrow. Like, no one, there's no point complaining because she came through the generation before me where it was even worse. Um, so just so, to be specific, what can someone do when they're put in that position? Because despite the fact that several VCs have lost their funds and their yeah. LPs have turned, which I think is fabulous, yeah. the fact that people are being held accountable, which is an old uh, boys club being opened yeah. up. But what do people do in the moment? And then what do you do the day after? I mean, you can put on your, your, your big girl panties. That, that, that's, that's absolutely. But that doesn't change the number of creepy people who still yeah. are inappropriate. So. Yeah, so, so the answer is nothing. That's my oh, answer. answer. That's been my answer. Um, that you do nothing, that you you move on to the next person or you find somebody else in the organization that will speak to you like you're on the same level as them. Um, and it's way more complicated than just sexual harassment because those tend to be outliers, but what's happening on a, a regular basis is you're you're getting these, you're, I think it's a little bit less now, I'm in a different position than I was then, but you're, you get these insinuations like, well, how's someone like you gonna sell into this industry? That's pretty what do they old mean by school. Twenty six, blonde, tall, and probably oh. those things, right? right. <laughs> so you get that stuff too that kind of piles up, and then you're like, well, maybe I should believe them. And and I mean that's kind of the hard part. But I think the the answer for me, and I think the answer will be different for the next generation of women coming through. They're um, they're different, but the answer for me was always do nothing. Go and don't put your energy on it. Try to try to ignore it. Go find another person. Um, for me, I had other battles, which was raising capital, getting people to buy your product, servicing the product, HR. Like I had all these other battles. Why would I? Why would I fight that one? Understood. And so for me, that's that's. I spent a lot of time thinking about it and up late at night, and I lost customers and investors over it because 
if I got into a situation like that, I would just go, next. Yeah. <laughs> like, you just wouldn't expose yourself to it. Screw it. I'm going somewhere else and seeing if somebody else will speak to me like I'm an adult. So um, it's definitely a problem, and I definitely experienced it, and I don't know anyone who hasn't. And if they, have, if they say they haven't, I, I actually think they're lying. <laughs> I don't want to keep hammering on this, and I promise we'll get to a more fun topic, but you talk about that inner dialogue yeah. and how these creeps and other th related incidents undermine the confidence. Yeah. But you and I both know that entrepreneurship requires a ton of confidence to be able to mm -hmm. live through the uncertainty, the doors slamming in your face, people telling you this is ridiculous, regardless of gender. Yeah. Walk me back to the early days before you had the success, the track record, which gave you the external confidence, how does one, at a young age, without those external validational points, work through it? Is it, is it blind belief in yourself? Is it, is it the support of, of the family? Is it, is it just the, the, the hope that now that I have to post money, I have to move forward anyway, so I got, like, how was it for you? I think that was it. I think that once you jump off this cliff, and for me, an entrepreneur jumps off a cliff when they're taking someone else's funding. Absolutely. To me, that's when it is. Because um, they have to answer to that person in yeah, some way or another. Yeah, and it's now your record and your reputation and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. to me, it's like once you jump off the cliff, you do not have a choice. And so there's little tricks. Um, when I first had to start public speaking, I actually went and went to a public speaking coach. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the same woman that trained I don't know if she wants people to know this. She trained Rob Ford. She's like, he was a disaster when I first had him. And look at him now. <laughs> He's so much better. But I, I remember, and she's like, little things, you know, the way you breathe, the way you put your arm, like, there's little things you can do that actually bring your, um, the nerves down, the anxiety down, and that kind of thing. But you're absolutely right. Um, this self, the way you talk to yourself is really important because you start to believe it. Um, but... I think it's pretty normal that a lot of entrepreneurs um, have a lot of doubt because they're getting it from other people. So how do you do it? Um, I think once you jump off the cliff, you don't have a choice. And so you just do a lot of little things, which is you just wake up and keep going. You just make the next call, write the next email. And instead of spending that time, I guess, I hate to say feeling sorry for yourself, but that's the words I'm that are coming out. Mm -hmm. Instead of spending that time feeling sorry for yourself, you just do other stuff that hopefully add up. So put your energy into something that can have a positive yeah, impact instead I of mean, dwelling on someone, someone else's said, negativity. Yeah, someone once said, like, worrying's a rocking chair. Like, it's great, it just doesn't get you anywhere. Like, you just... Worrying there. is a rocking chair. I like that. <laughs> so, I'm, gonna have to I'm use worried, that. I'm worried, I'm worried. But I'm not going anywhere. So it's, that's a lot of energy. You're like, oh, energy. I'm so worried. Look at all these scenarios. So instead, you could go, well, what if we email this person and then that person, and maybe we can book a flight and go and see so-and-so. So that's a different type of energy and Find that's a a productive energy. Okay. So um, easy to say now, right? Well, in um, retrospect, everything is always easier. When you're looking backwards. Yeah, when you're looking backwards, right? <laughs> Let's do something fun. Let's talk about, our, we both have time with Dragon's Den in different roles. Um, it's had a huge impact on the dialogue around entrepreneurship. You know, I don't hold Dragon's Den to be a, a realistic or accurate depiction of venture capital or private equity, just like I don't hold The Apprentice to be how HR should be run. <laughs> but, but it does highlight moments in the journey and then just makes them a lot more dramatic. What is all of your experiences done to your investment philosophy? How does what came before inform what you want to support going forward? Well, in three years have gone by since I made my first investments off that show. And um, the number one thing for me has been a lot like you're doing now with Naked Entrepreneur, you're digging into somebody and trying to figure out how much grit they have and how focused they are and that kind of stuff. For me, when you're investing in a company at that early of a stage, Next Gen Den was earlier stage Much than earlier. Dragon's Den. We and were more technical focused often. It wasn't they were mostly, all for TV kind of. Yeah, yeah, they were mostly tech companies, all less, $100,000 or less that they were looking for. Very, very early stage, really young entrepreneurs. They had to be under 40. Most of them were under 30. Um, it's all about the entrepreneur at that stage. It's That's the only thing you're investing okay. in. So let's focus on that. What are 
Nicole's favorite things to look for in an entrepreneur before you write a check? So my favorite thing is domain expertise. So domain knowledge, yeah. I think it's because that's where I came from. I was in this manufacturing world dealing with contracts and government contracts and I felt that that's been my competitive advantage having that domain expertise. Okay. So as opposed to the kid that graduates from university and orders pizza every night and then stands up and wants to launch an app to optimize pizza delivery, for me I really like the entrepreneurs that went and spent five years working in a domain and now they have a way to improve that domain. That domain that's not flooded with startups and so ideas. So spend five years thing. working at a Fortune 500 company, see an opportunity that they're not doing well, use that knowledge to sort of find something to... Yeah, be to Fortune 500, you could be the paper boy and realize the paper routes are inefficient and there's a better way to do it. I mean, there's... I just, for me, that was something I really liked was domain expertise. Okay. And then I like the formula of applying something that you know works in another area and applying it to that domain. So the Uber for this, or the mm -hmm. IoT device for this thing I know a lot about. Maybe I worked the in Netflix construction. For X, or... Yeah, so that's the formula that I like. But then after all the excitement, and now the entrepreneur is kind of on his own, call me if you need me, a few years go by. You've been through all this. Many times. It's all about how focused they are. So I think it's around probing how many other startups have you got? Like, what other ideas are you, are you working on? This? Is are this you full-time on this? Is where all your energy is? Are you full-time on this? What's your real dream? Like, do you really... Like, are you just doing this, but you really want to be this other thing? So um, that's, to me, that those are the two things. Okay. Let's get into our rapid fire questions. Oh, God. So these are our much shorter answers. Uh, first thing that comes to mind. The, I hate these games. <laughs> I know, but they're fun. The, uh, the word that most describes entrepreneurship is? Grit. What I learned from my family most is? Grit. <laughs> this could be a theme for you. The, oh, I'll have to switch then. The dragon I'd like to most be in business other than myself would be? Michelle Romano. She's a friend of mine. So. Yeah, you guys do well together. My best investment to date? Sheerly genius. Um, sheer pantyhose that don't rip. You know how many times I'm running to a meeting and I catch one, I'm like, oh, damn it. Taxi driver, Uber driver, please stop at the shopper's drug mart on the way. So not my typical investment, but solving a real problem. The real unmet market need that led to OMX. Because we should talk a little bit about that. So just first off, let's start with the value prop. What is the what, what, what is the main reason you created this company? It's uh, digitizing your supply chain and managing all your supplier data and then really drilling into what the economic impact is of, of what you do. So but what was the unmet market need that you well, learned about? <laughs> that was different than that, what we have now. <laughs> that, that, that led to this and how did that evolve? How did you pivot there? So I was working in government contracting and we were mostly selling to governments, mm -hmm. but a lot of the times we were trying to sell to the companies that sell to governments. Okay. So we were a small business in that supply chain and we had to pay brokers big percentages to get access into those supply chains. 10% sometimes of big deals. So that was my um, first desire, was to Eliminate disintermediate that. the disintermediate. brokers. Okay. But you know, when I got into it, it was a lot more complicated than that. Um, so now we are a CRM for supply chain, and we focus on country of origin. So all this talk around free trade deals, um, you know, Donald Trump blows up because an air conditioning company has their manufacturers in Mexico. Our platform is actually measuring how American a supply chain could be lower down through multiple tiers. Because that Mexican manufacturing company could be using U.S. parts, could be using U.S. steel. It, there's Correct, many yeah. pieces that are very, going on here. Yeah. So before you conclude that it's awful, it might not be as awful as one thinks. It's very complicated. Um, exactly. And then translating that into impacts to GDP, impacts to jobs, that sort of thing. So we're we're replacing massive Excel sheets that are normally, within a big company, only one person knows how the thing works. We're replacing those old school supplier portals where you're trying to sign up to be a supplier and some guy in another state has it on the downloads into an Excel sheet. It's more like an internal LinkedIn. And then um, we're replacing these big consulting efforts to try to aggregate that data. It is unbelievable how far behind most of these huge corporations and the government are when it comes to their internal processes. Like, they're 10 or 15 years behind sort of what consumers do day to day in terms of the digital world. And so that's provided you with a great opportunity, but you and I both would, would agree that you have to be passionate about your startup's cause because you're gonna be living it for 10 to 15 years. What makes you passionate about 
point of origin, about, well, about, about giving transparency to the supply chain. Like, why is that what you wake up every day so and go, let's do this? I'm passionate about small businesses getting access to these procurement opportunities mm. without having to pay these complex broker systems or having to, you know, be in with the one procurement guy that's used to going to lunch with somebody else. I'm passionate about opening up access to um, more companies, more local, more small, more diverse. So if you're building a pipeline in Canada, you can use our tool to be sending out procurement opportunities to local companies and then translating how that how that um, impacts GDP and job creation. So I'm passionate about small companies getting access to more of these procurement opportunities and these big companies that have that have signed on to government requirements. So mining, infrastructure, energy, aerospace, defense, um, and there's even more sectors that based on government permits or winning, co they have requirements to be kind of sourcing locally and tracking all this stuff. So I think that technology is a great way to make that connection. Now, uh, another way you make connections through technology is through Glass Frog. So Oh, no, 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 I haven't done that since 2010. So Gla Glass Frog was a charity I set up in Haiti. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was just around uh, raising money for shelters in Haiti because my first startup, we had, a fact we had factories in Dominican on the border. But that was in 2010, and it was only around for about a year. Why did you start up a charity? Why did you start up a not-for-profit? <laughs> because I was on the ground in Haiti. I went to Haiti six times uh, that year. And um, we were building shelters for the U.S. government. When you say government. that year, you should make sure everyone knows. It was that in the 2010 year, the, when the earthquake, the, the big earthquake. earthquake happened. And um, we were building shelters for the U.S. government. The, the startup I had and my parents' business had some kind of connection to that. And... Um, we were trying to donate shelters and water systems. We were we were sowing PVC water bladders that could store clean water. Yeah. We I was trying to donate them. And you're I, still gonna get it through because of the corruption. Oh of my the, it was insane. We I spent so much UNICEF I, I I'm sure those organizations do a lot of good stuff, but to, to figure out how to actually donate stuff to them, real goods, it's very, very complicated, and there was a lot of money flowing and a lot of contracts going in these opaque systems and the stuff never arriving. And so I just said, screw it, we'll just raise our own funds and um, get our own parts and goods over there and just go direct. Understood. Let's go back to some rapid-fire questions. <laughs> what do you wish Canada was more known for? <sighs> I mean, entrepreneurship. I think we need a culture here. That is more entrepreneurial. It's 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 the entrepreneur community is great, but I want the companies and the bigger companies to be more open to using innovation and using some of these technologies. It's sad when you meet, I mean us included, you meet these really amazing companies that are big tech innovation in Canada that have had to raise all their money in the states mm -hmm. or China. Lots of people raise money in China. And then they turn around and start selling their product. They're selling all their product to the United States and China. Well, what's that doing? For our... That's making our large companies less competitive. Mm -hmm. So is there, I think we need to think about that. They're connected. There isn't a tech community and then an energy community, an infrastructure community. There is, there is Canada. And those other companies should see tech as their key competitive advantage. If they're not, then they're working in two different silos. And our tech community is becoming successful by selling to the states and selling to other countries and making those companies more competitive against our main, our, our companies. Great. What is Canada's competitive advantage? The people. I, I think I, <coughs> great talent and we have an ability to sell all, all over the world. We have such a multicultural country. Um, I met the CEO recently of a company that sells uh, Voices, Voices.com. Mm -hmm. We use them well. in our videos. Yeah, from and London, I, Ontario. Yeah, I was sitting there going, <clears throat> of course you're based in Toronto. You're doing Voices all over the world, and, and we use them, didn't know they were in Canada. So you see stories like that, and our story is really interesting. Our, our team, we've got people from South America and India. We've brought them over, and they've created this team, and it's a great team that we could be selling all over the world because we have such a good multicultural uh, team, so we're we're really good at that. But we we have a great resource sector. The the mining sector is headquartered in Toronto. We have these sectors. It's just how do we bridge that in with the tech community and the entrepreneurial spirit to be just a bit more aggressive? I think we're a little too nice. Well, you're definitely not too nice. Thank <laughs> you so much for spending so much time with us today. Thank you. You're watching the Naked Entrepreneur. <laughs>